I apologize. I closed my email because I kept getting emails and that's where I have all the questions at. So bear with me as I'm. I also want to mention at this point, while Travis is looking for that, if you all would please, uh, if any of you need a certificate of attendance, just send me a uh, note in the chat um, and please include your, just put your full name and certificate and that will, uh, that will let me know that you need a certificate of attendance. So there you go. All right, I've got it pulled up. Um, so the first comment was, it just says friends, homework, and secrecy, right? We talked a lot about that. My best advice for friends is know who your children's friends are. If your child has a friend that you don't know who it is, to me, it's a problem. Um, you want to know who each one of the friends are. It's good to get to know their parents. Um, it, it's good to get to know all these small pieces and all these things. So please know who your child is hanging out with, know who they're going out to go spend the evening with, to go to a movie with, whatever they're doing. Um, know who they're going to hang out with, where they're going, what they're doing. It's not micromanaging your child. Your child will see it as that, but it's good parenting and it keeps them out of trouble for the most part. Because if you know Johnny is a bad influence or Sally is a bad influence and you hear your child's gonna go hang out with Johnny or Sally, you're gonna run into a problem. Leanne, did you have a question? I do, but you can finish with your list there. I know you were oh, on number one. You're good. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned during the slide about having a conversation, not just one-sided uh, when you talk to your child. Mm -hmm. I have a very introvert child, and it's very, it's extremely difficult to have a conversation with her. Sure. Sure. In that situation, Leanne, what I would suggest to anybody is try and find something your child likes to do. Um, it's similar to what we do in therapy. So when I do therapy with kids, it's not always just sitting in the office. When I have the introverted kid, we may be out riding bikes. We may be out fishing. We may be out at the pond, maybe shooting hoops, um, maybe, maybe playing video games if that's what they like. Uh, but find that activity so you can have that. But if your child's just absolutely not willing to engage, know that they're still listening. Um, even though they may be rolling their eyes or, or kind of nodding off, whatever it is, know that they're still getting that information to you. Just shorten it. Don't have like a 10, 15 minute conversation where you're the only one talking. Because if you really think about it, and I, I can use personal examples here, when my parents sat down and talked to me for probably anything longer than five minutes without me being able to say anything, I don't remember a word of what they said. It started zoning out. And we start, as parents, we start to sound like the, the teacher from Charlie Brown, just a wah, 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 wah constantly. And the kids really start to zone us out. So five minutes is kind of that limit. So try and time, time sort it. I could talk about these things for two hours. Ask Jim, I'm a big talker. Um, but they limit it to 15, 20 minutes, which makes it so then we can get to questions. So that makes me have to be concise and, and move on. Is that helpful, Leanne? It is. I have a follow-up question. Sure. Sorry, my dog's in the background. Um, I have a a co-parent situation where the co-parent is very unsupportive of my ideas and what I see in our child. So it's definitely a split household situation. Gotcha. Ideas for me on that. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> um, no. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it, it's a tough situation. And we run into that a lot at family service, as you can probably imagine, um, from, from families with separations, families with a co-parenting situations, whatever it is. Um, we really run into those situations quite a bit. And we want to make sure we support you guys in that. Um, obviously, you could always seek an intermediate person like a therapist to help with that and kind of guide that conversation. Um, it, it, it's definitely difficult, though, because if your ideas don't match dad's ideas or mom's ideas or whoever it is, ideas, grandma's, it, it, it's hard when you're not on the same page. And so teaching your kid and coaching your kid that sometimes parents aren't always on the same page, um, but you still have to meet the expectations of individual parents, unless they're complete opposites. Um, if they're complete opposites, then that becomes an incredible challenge um, that you really have to try and get on the same page as the co-parent. Um, and if you can't, you know, I mean, if, if it's a divorce situation, I, I mean, I would talk to courts about it. I would talk to, again, therapists about it if you're involved with therapists, just the importance of it, because you guys have to be a team. Um, and that's the really hard part is if you're not a team, it, it's going to be a, it's going to be a disaster and it's not going to go well. And I think that's probably, it sounds like kind of what you're feeling sometimes. Every day. <laughs> Yeah, but well, that's my best advice is, is if you get a chance to pull aside to the co-parent to have a conversation and say, hey, here's why. Let's let's sit down. Let's have this best interest conversation about my children. This isn't about you and me. This is about our kids. This is about the children that we are parenting together. It doesn't matter about 
you, it doesn't matter about me, try and find a way you can compromise. You're not going to hit everything you want. They're not going to get everything they want. But if you guys can find a way to compromise somewhere in the middle might be the best option for you. Um, homework and secrecy. We already talked about homework quite a bit. There's going to be a lot more. Um, keeping up with it. You guys have ways, super parent spy traps now that when I was a kid, I'm glad they didn't have them because I was terrible at keeping up with my homework. Um, but you can you can track them on their power school, their, their whatever it is they, they, they're using in different schools now. You can track that. You can track their grades. Do it. If you have access to it, you have it for a reason. Check it on your excuse me, check it on your kids, make sure they're keeping up because once they fall behind, it's a disaster. Um, you, you, will, you will do so much better for your child. They don't like it when you look over their shoulders, but it's okay. You're there to still be their parent. They're trying to become independent. They're trying to push you away at seventh and eighth grade and sixth grade because they think they're big, mature, many adults, like we said earlier. That's okay. We want them to do that to a degree. You're going to see your kids a lot less when they start middle school because of activities, because of friends. They, they, they become different beings almost, and, and you see a lot less of your children. For those of you who have middle schools, I'm sure schools, I'm sure you can already test to some of that. Um, secrecy is hard, and this is why I've emphasized throughout the training is talk with your kids, be open, and have those conversations. Um, next question is, how do you help your teenagers anxiety with school pressures, social awkwardness, and anxiety in general? Um, anxiety is, is one of my fortes. I love working with kids with anxiety. Um, again, just be direct with it. Um, we don't want to necessarily try and help them avoid anxiety, give them too many resources or, or crutches to help them deal with their anxiety. We want them to address it directly. We want to know what the anxiety is. And if you think the anxiety is excessive, call us. It'll hold a family service and guidance center. Um, we have an anxiety treatment program and it is amazing. Usually in about 16 sessions, the kid's done. Um, it's about 16 weeks if we can get them in weekly. Um, and it's taken care of. Sometimes we have kids with smaller amounts of anxiety. We'll just give some psychoeducational information. And the families are like, oh, you know what? This makes perfect sense. Let's move on from there. I won't jump too deep into that because this isn't just focus on anxiety, but know that there is going to be anxiety. There's going to be a lot of school pressure, like I was talking about earlier, associated with like competitions, with grades, things like that. Be real with your child and be real with your child's expectations. Um, focus on their strengths. Um, if your child is, is typically a straight A student and maybe getting some Bs and struggling with that, or maybe getting some Cs or, or Ds or failing some classes or having a hard time, whatever it is, focus on their strengths. Well, I, I have a kid I'm working with right now who has straight A's. He's never had straight A's in his life and he's failing one class. Um, and his mom's having a really hard time letting that, letting, letting that F go. Well, she shouldn't. She should focus on that failing grade. He needs to get that up. And he has. Um, What's really interesting about it is I had to try and reframe what she was saying and saying, yeah, but look at all these A's he has. Like, like, let's not just say he's failing in school. This has been an excellent school year for him. He's got A's in everything except for this one class. Does he need to work on it? Yeah, but, but let's look at where else, what else is going well. So don't just focus on what's not going well. We are so bad about that. We are such creatures of habit. Um, it's so easy to go home and see your spouse and say, oh, the house isn't clean. Oh, I wonder why this isn't done. Why, why that isn't done. When in reality, we don't realize how much has it actually gotten done while we're there, uh, while, while we were gone or, or whatever it is. Um, so really focus on those strengths of your kid. Um, let's not just point out what's not going well. When they come home from school, try and find something they did well. I, I refer to it as catch them being good. I talk about it with our supervisors here in our crisis program. We try and catch our staff being good. Um, it's so easy to be punitive. It's so easy to be negative focused and only talk to staff and, and, and have those one-on-one -on -one conversations and supervision or when they've done something wrong. We pull staff aside and we pull clients aside in our crisis program saying, hey, you did a really good job handling that. Let's go call your mom real quick. Handle the situation. You calm down after a tantrum. Let's go call your parents and, and, and mom and dad and tell them how you did. Even though the kid got upset, we're rewarding them in that calming down process. The next question is how do you balance letting your child work through how to handle a bully on their own? And at what point, if any, do you as a parent reach out to the bully's parents and discuss their actions? Most kids do not want the parents to reach out in fear that it will make things worse. In most situations, I would recommend reaching out to the school first. The school is gonna have more input about who that kid is and who that child's parents are. You don't wanna reach out to a parent who's gonna be completely unsupportive of it, and I have seen this happen, unfortunately, too many times where the parent where the parent of the child being bullied reaches out to the parent of the child bullying and, and it gets worse uh, because that parent is like, oh, they're just being a baby or whatever it is. It comes from somewhere, right? Uh, every behavior has a purpose. It's, it's meant to meet a need or it's learned or whatever. 
And so you may be feeding into it if you do that. I would encourage you to talk to the school about it. If your child comes to you saying they're bullied, you can try a, a week, maybe two, of trying to work, help your child work through it on their own, the things we talked about earlier, um, by doing things like having your child have a friend with them, uh, walking away from it, eliminating those outside that might be laughing at it or something like that. Schools know this. We work well with schools on that, and schools are doing a really good job, probably better than ever that I've seen in my 16 years here at Family Service um, in, in doing that um, and, and really identifying what drives the bully a lot of times and it's, it's the attention they get from it. And so if we can find those super peers, those superheroes, as a lot of schools call them, um, where they, they shut it down. Hey, man, that's not cool. You get one peer saying that, and that bully takes a whole different approach to, to what happened when five people aren't laughing at what he said or she said. But again, I would strongly encourage you to get involved in those situations because if your child's bringing it to you, more than likely it's been going on for a while. It's been going on long enough for them to be bothered enough to come talk to you about it. Um, so if, if you see it on the side, that's one thing. Talk to your child about it. You see it at a game or something like that, a sporting event. But if your child's coming to talk to you about it, what I typically see is it's been going on for quite a while and they just haven't wanted to bring it up to your attention yet for fear of embarrassment because they feel ashamed because they don't feel good about it because the bully's been successful in shaming them. Um, what are some suggestions for phone rules and tips on checking phones? What a great question that is. Um, check them frequently. Um, check them all the time. Know who your child's texting. Not like every day. I guess that's a little excessive. Um, but but know who your friends are. Know who your child's getting on phone with. Monitor social media. Be friends with your child on Instagram, on Facebook, on all these things you can post things on. Um, go through pictures occasionally. Um, just be open that that's the contract that you're going to have with your child about having a phone. Kids get themselves in hot water very quickly with cell phones from sending pictures of themselves, of nude photos of themselves or sharing them, um, sending threats to each other, bullying over, over social media, texting, things like that. So you, it's something you do want to be aware of. Um, my oldest daughter just got a cell phone, uh, mainly just for the purpose of safety um, when she's out with grandparents or or something else, not that we don't trust grandparents, obviously, but that way she has a way to contact us. She can contact friends who are now have cell phones or her cousins or whatever it is, aunts and uncles, et cetera. Um, and we have strict rules with it. And we do check her cell phone. Um, we check who she's texting. We check when she's texting. We check what she's getting on the internet. But before we handed her the phone, we told her those were the expectations and that we would be doing a weekly check at least. Um, not that I don't trust my daughter at all. It's very easy to get into a black hole on the internet though and get yourself in trouble very quickly. Um, it's very easy to get on weird YouTube videos. Um, while YouTube is censored, it's very easy to get on weird YouTube videos that can go a dark path as well. Um, if, you, if you look recently at some of the stuff on TikTok, um, right now there is a trend going on TikTok that's disgusting. It's awful. I won't get too far into it, um, but we're, we're aware of it as an agency. We're working with schools on it as well, um, but it's, it, it's a new trend on, on TikTok, and it's just why would someone do this, right? So be aware of what's going on. Be aware of social media. Look for what's trending in those things on the kid, on that your kids are on as well. Um, and also know that when your child's doing things like TikTok, they're putting their image out there for the nation, for, for the world to see. It's hard to block those things. So they're, they're, they're able to be seen by everybody. So be mindful of that. I, I, I suggest checking it frequently and kind of the contract, I guess you could say, hey, I'll pay for your phone, but here's the deal. I'm checking it. Um, Next question, how do you have a conversation about drugs and alcohol? Uh, I tried to have the conversation, but all I got were eye rolls. Absolutely. You're gonna get attitude, you're gonna get guff, you're gonna get eye rolls, have the conversation anyway. And eventually, ideally, the youth will start talking back to you about it as well. Um, again, very direct, very open about the conversation. Um, don't just tell them don't do drugs, don't do alcohol. Let's have a conversation about what it does to your body. Let's talk about the dangers of it. Let's talk about what happens when someone spikes a drink. Let's talk about what happens when someone spikes marijuana with fentanyl. Let's have those conversations. If you don't know, Google it. It's terrifying. Um, just, just know that um, you, your child may do something like marijuana um, and they may not know what's in it. So know that they don't know where it's coming from and emphasize things like that. That you, you, you could get it from someone you trust. Obviously, we don't want our children using drugs or substances of any kind, but we want them to also know the consequences of, of it if they do do it. Legal consequences, health consequences, et cetera. Again, have an open conversation. Even if your child's rolling their eyes, they're still listening to you as long as you're not doing this 15-minute long lecture. Keep it short, 
keep it concise. You might want to break it up into multiple conversations over multiple weeks. That's fine. Um, but, but have a conversation, keep it open and have that conversation. It's a conversation I have with my kids. Um, I have an 11 and a seven and a three-year-old. My three-year-old has no idea what I'm talking about, nor am I too concerned about him, but my seven-year-old does. And she knows what's right and wrong. And she knows what's good and bad. Um, does that mean she's going to make good choices all the time? Absolutely not. She will make bad choices at some point. Um, I, I hope not. I hope this never goes that direction. Um, and I'm going to do everything I can to prevent it from going that direction. And we should as parents, and to do that, we start teaching them early. We start teaching them young. And we keep that conversation open to teach them that when we're having this conversation as a seven-year-old, hopefully when she's 13, 14, she's not rolling her eyes at me. She's telling me about what's going on at school in those situations. So eventually, you might see that eye rolling stop. Um, how to help a child who has special needs deal with te teasing? Go the same way. Talk to the school about it. Um, talk to the school. And, and again, I can't go too far into details on this because it kind of depends on the situation specifically. Um, but, but talk to the school, get support, and find those super peers, those superheroes um, that, that will support your child as well. Um, find, find those people that will help. Um, it reminds me, I, I, had a, I just had a wonderful class in high school, uh, and my class had a lower functioning child, and it was a small school at Silver Lake, and other classes would tease her and make fun of her for being lower functioning or having an accident in class or, or, or not knowing her period came in and, and, and bleeding through her pants. Um, and, and so it was, it was really difficult for us to see, and we really banded together, and anyone who would say anything to her in any negative way always heard from us, not in a threatening way, but in a way of, hey, this is our sister, this is our girl, we take care of her, we take care of you if you don't do this anymore. And it really stopped it. Our, our class was really good about that across the board. Um, and I don't know how it, it developed that way. But if you find peers like that, if you find super peers like that as a school, a lot of 501 district, I think refers to them as super peers a lot. Um, find those kids, ask about those kids that can help in those situations who are willing to step up, lend a hand and, and, and do that. It doesn't have to be a popular kid. It can be anybody. But if that bully gets that, that shaming and that kind of like, well, hold on, what do you do, man? That's not cool. They think about it a little bit differently than it, when people all laugh at it. Um, yes, Leanne. So I have a follow-up to one of the things that you said about your relationship with your child. So middle school um, has definitely changed my child and not my relationship. <laughs> um, <laughs> coming, I think, also a little bit of COVID in there, you know, last year and a half, they were at home. That didn't help, obviously. We're all trapped here together. Had enough probably limits of everyone as she's going through those hormone changes, right? And right. so our relationship has definitely sunk where I instruct family time and she doesn't want to have a part of it anymore. So in a way I enforce it but I don't want to enforce it because then that's a, it's a negative to her, but it's a way for me to still have time with her. How do I, what are skills where I can shift it where it won't seem like a negative to her? It seems like work to her. It sounds like. Yeah. How dare uh, you, mom? I don't want to be around you. <laughs> yep. And, and I'm sure other people aren't chiming in, but I'm sure we've all experienced this. Uh, my 11-year-old is at that tween age, as they call it now, and, and there are times, right? We have family game nights on Friday, or we go to our friends and play board games or whatever it is, and she's usually very into that because she likes that kind of stuff, but there are days when you, you don't mess with her. <laughs> there are days that, that it doesn't go that well. Um, I, I think, Leanne, what you're doing is great. It, it's a great start. It, it's a good start. Trying to force it, it is a challenge. If you force it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause more of a rift, more of a divide. Um See if there's things that if, if maybe she can come up with the idea of what the family does, if, it, if it's appropriate. Um, maybe you can find some time with her one-on-one -on -one too, just have some time with just mom, where you can go out with her and, and just have some that some one-on-one, -on -one, it's like, like, like a mom date, right? We do dates with all of our children, uh, my, my three-year-old on up, right? They, they all finish their schoolwork and that's kind of their, their reward for, for their reading classes or whatever they're doing. Um, they finish a quarter or a semester and we go do a date. They pick which parent they want to do a date with. Um, and, and we go out and then we just alternate, you know, I take the 11 year old and my wife takes the 11 year old the next time, et cetera. Um, so it, it works really well to, to get that one-on-one -on -one time too, because I, I have kids. I, I, Leanne, how old are your kids? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, 12 and seven. Yeah. So you got about the same spread, right? I've got an yeah. 11 and seven year old and they're best friends at times. And other times they, 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 they don't, they don't like each other at all. Yep. 
Um, and, and that's that's going to happen. There's a huge difference in maturity between a 12 and seven year old. They're going to be best friends sometimes, and sometimes they're going to be at each other's throats and 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 worst enemies. Uh, my seven year old advantage is when my 11 year old gets that way, she's got a three year old brother she can go past her. So and they truly are best friends. It, it's adorable most of the time um, until they're not. So uh, it, it, just just keep that in mind too. Um, there mm -hmm. are times when it works really well. Again, we just emphasize those times in our brains just psychologically at a time that's not going well. But I think some individual time might be helpful too is just talking about it. And, and maybe even again, being open about it. Man, man, we're really trying to have some family time and, and, and sit down and watch a movie together, a Christmas movie, whatever this time of year. And we really just wanna sit down and do something together. What would you pick for a snack? Like let her pick this movie snack or the, or the dinner or whatever it is. Cook dinner as a family. What's that? Empower her, empower her a little bit to yes. participate. Yes. Yep. Give, give her you. some choices. Let, let, let her have some choices in that. Um, I'm going to skip a couple questions because they are not that they're not good questions. They've just already been addressed more about bullying. Um, what are some signs to tell if there might be something going on at school that a tween will not tell you? Um, again, this is a really hard one. It's going to depend on every ind individual person's child. Um, just some general signs are pulling back more isolation from you guys, uh, isolating themselves in the room or away from their siblings, that kind of stuff, and just being more irritable. I know that's also a sign of, of puberty. I know that's also a sign of all these other things going on, but this is why I always have emphasized in trainings when working with youth is to have an open conversation with your child so we don't get the situation, don't make situations taboo, right? Have an open conversation, an open line of communication is your best friend with your child. Um, I still have a very open line of communication with my parents. They know everything that's going on in my life. Um, and, and I like it that way. Uh, I feel supported by my parents. I'm 36 years old and I still call my mom um, probably every other night just to say hi, right? Because I love my mom and I care about my mom and, and I have that relationship with her. Now, when I was 13, 14, 15 years old, I didn't want anything to do with my mom. I didn't want anything to do with my dad. I wanted to be myself. I wanted to be independent. But now when I look back at it at 36 years old, I, I wasn't like that all the time. I like the time that I had with mom and I like those little times I had with dad or whatever it was. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, again, the best way is, is by keeping an open line of communication. Um, that open line of communication and knowing what's going on and just having a five minute conversation after school. How was school? Tell me about your day, right? Um, that, is, that is our dinner process at my house. Um, at dinner, there's no electronics at the phone. At, at the table with the exception of my phone, just the nature of my job, I'm on call 24 seven, um, but I don't have it on anything. I, it, it's just sitting there unless I get a phone call. Um, but my, my, my kids, my wife, no electronics, no TV going, no music going, no stories playing on Audible or anything like that. We're gonna sit and talk about school. We're gonna talk about, we're just gonna have a conversation. Just make that part of our daily routine. If you haven't done that, it's hard to get kids into doing it, but they'll adjust just like with anything. Um, uh, kind of talked about this already. How do you address middle school age kids that are pushing boundaries, not wanting to do chores, being defiant when things are asked them, et cetera, at home more and more? This is a natural process of getting older. Um, similar to what I was saying to Leanne earlier, a lot of things we can do are kind of these little like cheat codes, I guess you can say, is I'm not saying don't give your kid out consequences. If they're going to be defiant, they're not going to do their chores. There's a natural consequence to that, right? It may not be, it may you don't get your allowance, but Maybe you don't get your game time. Maybe you lose your Xbox, whatever it is. Use computer time. I don't know. That's up to your family and whatever that is. I'm just make sure you're consistent with those rules and those expectations. The way I like to address that and the way we address it here in our crisis center is through something we call choice theory. Um, we give the kid a choice, basically. It's really basic. So let's say I have Johnny upstairs. Sorry, I use Johnny as an example. I don't know any Johnnies. So that's why I do it. Um, so if you're a child Johnny, I apologize. But so we have Johnny upstairs. I'm pointing upstairs because I'm in the crisis building now, um, but Johnny's having a hard time. He's refusing to do his chores here in our crisis center. We ask every kid that comes to our crisis center to do a chore, to help with cooking, to help with cleaning, to help with laundry, just to keep that sense of responsibility going while they're here. Johnny's refusing to do the, wipe the table down, we'll say, after dinner. Um, so what our staff will typically say to Johnny is, okay, Johnny, here's, here's what's going to happen. I said, I, I appreciate your choice in, in not wiping the table down, but if you choose not to wipe the table down, you're not going to get to do the game tonight with the, with the group. We're not going to get to do the movie tonight with the group, or you won't get a vote with the group on what movie we watch. Um, and so, so give them a little responsibility in it. The glorious thing about this and what it does is it makes the child responsible for their behavior 
and not you responsible for giving them a consequence. Because when Johnny comes back to me after I tell him that, Johnny says, well, Mr. Travis, you told me I couldn't watch a movie tonight. I can say, no, Johnny, remember the conversation we had? I told you that if you chose not to wash the table like you're supposed to, you don't get to wash it. So you made that decision. I'm sorry. And then we move on. Now, I do recommend you give another chance to do it when you're first starting these types of things. Um, I have a three-year-old at home and he gets chances because he's three, right? More volatile. My 11-year-old knows there's a fine line. Um, but but just know, I think that's the best way to do it. Um, it just, just give them choices and put it back on them. It, it's kind of a tricky way, but put it back on them. So you're not the one saying no. You're not the one taking something away. Sorry, Johnny, you took it away yourself. You chose not to follow the rule. So you took away the movie yourself. Yes, Leanne. I'm sorry. I'm very talkative too. Um, good. Yeah. Making good choices and following the expectations of the household is extremely hard right now. It's not untypical for my child to break at least one or two. And it's only like Tuesday. And it's like, well, then you're constantly losing and she's constantly having things taken away from her because she's not making the choices. It's a constant. So that negative is always there for her. So now I feel like she just gives up and doesn't make good choices because mom's just going to take it away anyway. Yeah. And that's, that's a dangerous pattern we can get into as parents. Um, and it's not that you're doing bad parenting by any means. It, it, it's what parenting typically looks like, right? And for some kids, it doesn't work. And so we have to, we have to look at it in a different way. So I don't do a lot of behavioral plans with kids, with clients I work with. I don't do them at all. Um, one reason is because I'm not good at them. The other reason is because I don't like how they work um, because they're focused on consequences. They're focused on taking things away. That's why I like this choice piece is that we're not taking away. The child's taking it away. So when my three-year-old tonight, when I get home and I'm trying to get him to bed and he throws a tantrum and he says, but I'm not ready for bed yet. I, I threaten it. This sounds weird. I threaten to take his pillow. That's his lovey. That's his stuffed animal. His pillow goes everywhere. He calls it his garbage truck, oddly enough, um, but, but it goes everywhere with him. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I'll, I'll say, hey, that's, that's fine. But if you keep coming out of your room, bud, you come out of your room one more time, I'm going to have to take your pillow. What he'll do is scream at me and shut me, shut the door and lock me out of his bedroom. Is that respectful? No. Does it solve the problem? Yeah, it absolutely does. He knows I'm going to be consistent in taking it away. Um, he knows I'm going to bit there. But yes, Leanne, your, your, your problems aren't unique to you by any means. This is probably everybody in this room has dealt with this, um, especially at middle school age. Consistency is going to be your best friend. It might take two years to, to get there again, but always trying to find a way to try, tie strengths into it as well. We don't want to be so focused on just everything negative our child's doing. We want right. to focus on what they're doing well. So when my, when my seven-year-old gets upset, she can throw a tantrum. She can scream. She can yell for 20 minutes sometimes, 30 minutes sometimes. She goes to her room. She'll listen to me in that. She might be tearing things up in her room, throwing things, screaming. I take things away from her. That's fine. But the reward for her is eventually calming down, right? I provide her with things to calm down that I know work, whether that's an, a book on Audible, whether that might be uh, drawing, coloring, something like that. So in that moment of a tantrum, it's not bad to give your child something to teach them how to cope. Does that help answer your question, Leanne? I hope I hope it doesn't take two years because, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what, welcome to parenting, right? Uh, hopefully it doesn't take two years either. Um, but but if, like I said, if, if you need more support, call around, ask. Um, well, we're here to help and this is what we do for a living, right? If, if I knew you better, Leanne, I knew your child better, I might have more direct interventions for you um, on how to handle it and it might be quick. Um, but again, we don't want to just focus on those negatives. We want to be strengths based. We want to figure out what they're doing right. So catch her being good, not just bad. I know in your mind, it's like, man, sometimes it's, it's the first couple of days in the week. It's already, everything is already ruined. Everything's already taken away. When you give consequences to kids, we want to give them chances to get it back to maybe not that night, but we don't want to take things away for a week or two at a time. Cause when we do that, it just becomes too punitive. So one day is typically what I recommend, um, is just, Hey, sorry, you're losing this for the night. Right. Yeah. You, you know, you're going to lose your phone for the night because you're being disrespectful to me. And that's the expectation. Does that make sense? No. Yeah. That's pretty much what I follow. And Good. it's kind of like a, a step process. So if you do one infraction, it's a one day two, you get two days type, you know, thing, but it just seems like it's constant. And I think you said something important there of 
um, tell them the consequences up front. Maybe she needs to be reminded every week that, hey, these are the cell phone rules or, hey, these are the expectations of chores. And um, if you don't maybe want to do the dishes, then let's talk about sweeping or a different chore idea. So you've had good ideas. I just need to implement now. Yeah, yeah. And Leanne, to take that the next step too, is when you said, um, you know, this one leads to one day, you keep doing it as two days, you keep doing it as three days, then it's four days. What, what happens, and, and I guess my question back to you is, and maybe just general statement, is in those situations, what we have to be careful of is once our child's upset, we can't expect them to reason with us. In our no, I definitely center, know that. Yes. Okay, yeah. In yes. our crisis center, we, we tell this to our staff all the time. We are constantly retraining our staff on this because it's hard. Because when a kid's mm -hmm. screaming and yelling or maybe punching or kicking, here in our crisis center, we see a little bit, probably more behaviors than you do in your house. I hope we do in some ways. Um, we get holes in the wall, et cetera. When a kid's going off like that, we send other kids downstairs and we're going to let that kid go because we're not going to, we're not going to put hands on them. We're going to let them be upset for a while. They can scream and yell at us all they want. They can charge at us. We'll, we try not to restrain kids at all. Um, we really don't do that often at all. I'm making our program sound wild. It's not that wild, trust me. Um, but we, we really want to take a step back and we really want to, to let that child work through that and provide them ways to calm down. And that's a really hard thing to do as a parent, right? Our staff here struggle with that who are mental health professionals. I've got a kid who's throwing a tantrum and I know he's going to calm down if I go goof around with him and play ping pong. Mm -hmm. A lot of our staff see that as, well, you're rewarding him with a ping pong game. I see it as, no, I'm rewarding with him, rewarding him by teaching him how to calm down. Right. Yeah. No, I understand that concept. She's um, an artist at nature. So even if it's just separating myself from her, because, you know, when you get that preteen who's constantly yelling at you, who is just going off, I sometimes even remove myself so that she can have further area to relax and calm down. Yep. Yep. And you're on the right track, Leanne. And, and that's, that's part of that, that personality change, I guess you could say, from when a youth changes from 10 to 11, 11 to 12, and puberty starts to play in. Um, it would be uh, it's a difficult transition time for parents too. Um, and just know that your child's trying to become more independent and your job is to help them become more independent by teaching them things like that. If she's into art, give her some art. So maybe she wants to do it with you. Maybe she wants to sit down with you and calm down doing art with mom. Uh, my wife is amazing at things like that. She has a much longer fuse than I do with our children. Um, and, and she can sit down with them while they're screaming and yelling and she can just sit and doodle. And eventually one will be like, oh, you know what? That seems like a cool little project. I'm going to come do it with you, right? So it's not like we're, we're going to continue to give consequences. Once they're upset, my suggestion is just give the consequence once. Let's try not to add on to it because they're not calm yet. If they calm completely and then they re-escalate, then we can revisit that because we don't want them to manipulate the situation either. But it's hard because once a kid starts to say, you know, I, I, my, ironically, my brother just texted me, my oldest brother, and I, I vividly remember when he was a kid, he would get in trouble. My parents say, you're grounded for a week. And he... he they, my mom or dad was someone going to make it two weeks and go ahead. I don't care. Why don't we make it three weeks? My parents go, okay, well, why would we make it four? We'll just go on until we've been it for two months. <laughs> and as a kid, I'm sitting back thinking like, well, this things you can't do with my brother for two months. Um, in reality, it, it would change quite a bit. So that kind of strategy, you got to just make sure you're in check and not upset in that situation too. If you're upset, you need to step back and just let your child go for a bit. Because if you're upset, you're going to make a bad choice most likely. Um, the rest of these questions, I have a few more questions. I'm just going to focus on one of them because the other ones are very similar to things we've already addressed. Um, the last question says, um, my child's in middle school this year and has been in several peer pressure scenarios, yet chooses not to tell me after making poor decisions. My child has an introvert personality, but regardless of the effort I put forth in asking questions about her day, school, and friends, do you have any suggestions for me? Keep at it. You're doing the right things. Um, we, for those of you who had middle schoolers, Jim, I know you've had a middle school, you may be able to attest to this too. Consistency is going to be everything. We're not going to solve the problems with every single kid, with every single intervention. It's going to be consistency and constantly being there. What's encouraging about this scenario is that whoever wrote this in, their child is talking to them about the situation eventually. Even though it's afterward and it's after a poor decision has been made, they're still talking about it and you're still getting a chance to parent and coach about that. If you look back to when you were a youth, when you were in middle school or high school, let's think about the, all the poor decisions you made that your parents didn't even know about, right? Have an open conversation. There's going to be a lot of stuff your kids are doing that you don't want to know about, that, that, that you do want to know about, and you're going to wish you didn't. Uh, and as they get older, it's going to keep going. 
you have to be okay with it as a parent. Um, it, it's scary. It's uncomfortable. It causes anxiety. Um, as a kid, I didn't care um, if my parents knew things or not. As a parent, I want to know everything going on in my child's life, but I also have to accept that I can't. I think the accepting part is the hard part for me because I'm the one that wrote that in and it's like, I just get little tidbits and I'm trying to piece them together. And I'm, I'm a logical thinker and I'm like, I know there's more. <laughs> I, I know by the way that she's walking that she's hiding something right now. Like I know my child's behavior and um, I'll just randomly see her walking around the house or moping and I'll be like, I, I'll think to myself, something's going on because um, her behavior right now, but how do I get that out of her? Find, find an icebreaker. That, that, that's my suggestion. Find an icebreaker. Find something fun to do. Um, if you see your daughter moping around or depressed or anxious, whatever it is, find an icebreaker. Go back to those things she likes to do. Focus on her strength. If she's into volleyball, go hit the volleyball around with her. If she's into dance, do some dance with her. Have her teach you something. And it just... The way it physically and, and, and chemically changes a child's brain to engage with something like that with their parent, it's amazing. And this is why I do therapy a lot of the way I do by going out and shooting hoops or playing ping pong or riding a bike. Um, we, we do a lot of that in our crisis center. And it's amazing we're out hiking with kids at the governor's mansion, what kids start to talk to us about and why they're in crisis versus us just being cooped up in the winter here all day and, and not going to the gym to play. It's a huge difference and it really does activate things a different way. So maybe approaching it, not just say, hey, something looks like it's wrong with you. Maybe you notice that and you approach it as, hey, you know what? Let's go for a walk tonight. Let's go walk the dog, right? Let's play a game tonight. You want to watch a movie with me? And that might open up that conversation just naturally with her. Any other questions? Questions are my favorite part, if you can't tell. Right. You're, you're muted if you're trying to talk, Jim. You're muted. That was probably the high point is me being muted for everybody. Um, <laughs> if we don't have any more questions, I think we're going to uh, wrap up. I want to thank those of you who made it tonight. This is a rough time of year to try to try to take an hour out of your free time. But but major ups to all of you. Um, you guys are, are, it's parenting done right. Um, I do want to mention, uh, the bad news is I did not, uh, accidentally forgot to record the, uh, Travis's first part of his presentation with the PowerPoint sl point slides. The two pieces of good news are we will be posting the PowerPoint slides tomorrow on our website, along with the video. And, uh, so, so you'll be able to look at the PowerPoint slides. And I did record the Q&A part of this. And Travis had a lot of really good stuff there. We had some really good questions. Um, again, thank you all for attending. Travis, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Tons of good information. And uh, keep an eye on our Facebook page. Leanne, Leanne once wanted to say something. Yes, Miss Leanne. No, I was just clapping. Oh, OK. Oh, it's OK. Sorry. I thought, I thought that was a raise hand. Um, thank you all for coming. We are going to be making some changes to how we do real world parenting. So if you want to keep up with that, um, keep an eye on our website. We'll be talking about it on our Facebook page. Um, and we will also be sending out uh, probably an email to everyone who has ever attended a real world parenting session, letting y'all know how we did it. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Travis. And everyone stay safe, stay socially distanced, do what you have to do because um, we want to see you back after Christmas. And uh, I want I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season. Okay. Thanks you so guys, much. Keep, keep in touch with us as an organization. If you guys have suggestions for us, if you guys have ideas for us, if you guys have questions, reach out. We want to be a support for you guys, whether you have clients with us or not, we're here for the community. And that, that's, that's why I love doing these things. I get excited about it. I love questions. I love it when you guys ask questions and seeing questions in. It really is a passion of mine and, and a passion of this organization is just teaching and, and preparing the community for, for things that could come up, whether your clients or not, we want to be involved. So let us know, give feedback to Jim and we'll go from there. And the other thing I just thought of was too, um, you know, your, your child doesn't have to be in crisis to come get engaged with services here at Family Service and Guidance Center. Um, you know, maybe uh, let, if we can help your kids while problems are small, 
Uh, that's always, I think, an easier fix than it is when we as parents, and I've done this my own self, uh, kind of put things off. Um, so I would hope that uh, if you're seeing something in your child that just doesn't seem quite right, give us a call, 232-5005. You can find it, just Google us, and our website will pop up, and there's lots of information there about the kinds of services we offer. Travis, anything else before we wrap up? That's all I got for y'all. All right. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Hope you have a great Christmas, and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Great Christmas.